Bias is an interesting problem for one to solve. For some, it's inherently impossible to see past their preconceived notions. Games you like must simply be amazing, for the simple fact that you played it growing up. And that one television program or movie must be awful, because some actor or actress you don't like is in a lead role. In the process of making videos, the few I've managed to actually put out, that is, I've begun to take a slightly closer look at the media I've consumed in the past in preparation for future content. One such game I ended up revisiting recently is one of my favorite games ever made. Twilight Princess is my favorite Zelda game ever made. Alongside being the very first Wii title I ever purchased, it's also the very first video game I ever beat on my own. No older cousins to help me with a hard boss, no friends who had a guidebook to help me out. No, it was just me, that stupid nunchuck, and my gumption. But my goal today is to look at this beloved game from multiple perspectives, rather than just my own. Look at the game for what it is, not what it is to me. Does that make sense? I hope so. Today we're going to talk about Twilight Princess, see what it did right, what it did wrong, and maybe compare it to some of the heavy hitters of the franchise. In this episode of Topic Change. For a good adventure game, one needs a solid reason to quest. For treasure, for glory, or to save someone or something, all usually fit the standard bill. And Twilight Princess mostly takes from that last pool, as most Zelda titles do. You play as Link, or Schlorp if you prefer. In this iteration, he has taken on the role of farm boy. In most Zelda games, Link comes from humble beginnings, which can help concentrate that connection you feel with him earlier on. This game begins in the humble village of Ordon. We meet plenty of folks here with the usual brand of eclectic personalities found in NPCs from the series. You've got the hawk guy, the jolly shopkeep, the strong village chief, and plenty others. I know a lot of people tend to complain about this section of the game, citing it as a rather cumbersome speed bump for repeat playthroughs, but you have to keep in mind that this is a story-based adventure game. Although it's not the sole focus of the game, there are plenty of text boxes, cutscenes, and other story beats layered throughout. Having to live a normal life for 30 minutes at most when you know what you're doing isn't really a bad thing. Meeting these characters and hearing how they regard Link and interact with him gives a little bit of a hint as to how his life has been lived thus far. He's a helpful guy, capable and well-liked. One thing I really like about this opening sequence is how a lot of tutorial content is recontextualized as Link showing off cool sword techniques to the kids in town, or having them wonder aloud if he knows how to shoot a slingshot by pressing the right buttons. It's a very simple idea, but it's written well enough and builds a positive relationship internally towards both our own character and the cast of kids around town. When these kids get nabbed later, both in a few minutes and hours from now, you'll feel a sense of duty to go after them since you made those connections so early. One other thing I don't think a lot of players take into account is how this section of the game sets up the expectations of you, the player. Stuff like helping people around town and saving the kids instills a sense of goodness and heroism that Link exudes. I know it's probably a bit silly to point out, but Link is a good guy. A hero, you might even say. And so this introductory sequence helps to sell that, which gives you a good expectation of how the rest of the game will go. You'll fight monsters and explore the world, sure, but you'll also be helping folks along the way and solving simple stuff as well. All in all, the game expects you to be a good person, and I think it sets up that expectation very well. I know that's kind of the point of introductory sequences, but I just think it's neat. As the story unfolds, we learn that Russell, the resident cool guy, has a special sword for Link to deliver to Hyrule Castle. It's a simple cutscene, but it sets your expectations up in a fun way. You're gonna head out on a cool adventure, maybe you'll run into some beasts on the way, and I bet Zelda will say something like, that sword is for the legendary hero, and that's you! But you don't get to leave the village the way you'd expect. No, something sinister comes for a visit first. It's here that we're introduced to one of our main gimmicks. Link is cursed with a sort of werewolf-type transformation. Rather than becoming a hulking beast, he simply is a wolf. A good portion of gameplay will be done in this wolf form, and this, just like the intro, is a point of contention for a lot of folks. I personally don't mind, of course, or else this video would probably have a much harsher title, but I can see where they're coming from. For the majority of the first half of the game, Early exploration is first done as Wolf Link, chasing down smells that lead you to the next story objective, rooting out spirit bugs to cleanse the new portions of the map you found, and then recontextualizing those same locations as Link. 
It lets them reuse spaces they've already created in a way that doesn't feel too cheap, and makes retracing your steps during these portions have a unique purpose alongside the standard backtracking you'll end up doing later for collectibles. This, to me, is a positive, but something that informs the issue is the difference in how gameplay is presented to you. While the two versions of Link play in a generally similar way, their goals are noticeably different. Playing as Link is about exploration, solving puzzles, and fighting monsters. And while Wolf Link has those elements too, the overarching point of being Wolf Link is to stop being Wolf Link. Since you're cursed to be a wolf, it infers a negative connotation. It's not an epic transformation where you gain immense power. It's treated more like a debuff or something of the sort, especially this early on. You can't access any of your equipment, you can't talk to any human character directly, and combat is generally very simplistic. If you're faced with a threat, it can probably just be slapped away with your homing attack over and over, which can create a sense of monotony rather than empowerment. And while those things are true, I think having Wolf Link definitely adds to the game rather than detracting. Its inclusion enhances the bleak atmosphere that the game sets upon you. Being cursed like this really sells, especially in this introductory sequence, just how confused and out of his depth Link really is. Freeing yourself from this curse, even temporarily, also elevates the feeling of strength and forward progress you feel when you become human again, like you're in control and can handle the coming threats more effectively. The eventual upgrades we get, such as being able to swap forms freely and teleport around the map, definitely alleviate this helpless feeling as you and Link both gain more skill and confidence, but I can't help shake the thought that introducing those upgrades a bit sooner would have met a more positive reception for a lot more of the player base. Well, since we're on the subject of positive receptions. When it comes to adventures or quests, something a lot of games will do is pair you up with a companion of sorts. Zelda is notorious for this, especially in the 3D era. Characters like Navi or Fi? Fi? I don't know who act as helpful guides for newer players, are usually accosted by reviewers for being overbearing or chatting a bit too much. Considering this, one might assume a character like Midna, a helpful companion who gives you tutorial content early and provides advice on where to go next, would be ripe for that same sort of complaint. Somehow though, she just kinda works. Her personality is very cocky. When she's explaining things to you, she either talks down to you or is almost insulted that she needs to explain it all. In a way, she sees you as the companion that she has to lug around, and that altered dynamic was intriguing for a lot of players. It helps that she's so connected to the ongoing plot, I think. She's not just there to tell you things, she has goals of her own, secrets she keeps, things she wants to accomplish whether you help or not. This alternative dynamic for a buddy means that when she does show up to say something, you're probably going to be more invested in what she has to say. I'm not one of those people who ever hated Navi or anything, but there's a clear evolutionary line you can follow on characters that fill this role from Ocarina of Time onward, with the best iteration honestly being right here. So, you take a contentious gimmick in Wolf Link, and combine it with one of the better written buddy characters from the library of Nintendo games, and you're left with a pretty nice mix. You need each other to move forward in your respective quests, and despite her teasing, you decide to team up and move through this strange, dilapidated place you find yourself in, and out into the wider world. As with most sword-toting adventures, Zelda games feature plenty of exploration, and this game is certainly no exception, but how well does the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay hold up? In all honesty, there's not too much to say about the basic exploration. You can move in any direction, interact with things, swing your sword around, yada yada. The Wii version, which is arguably its original intended version, features motion-controlled menuing and aiming, and sword swings are tied generally to the direction you flick your remote in. A vertical swing of some measure will earn that as your first attack, and a horizontal one will do much the same in the opposite way. For being a Wii title though, it never really felt necessary or even central. You're holding a Wii remote, sure, and you're making motions, but it kind of felt like an afterthought, a necessity of being on the console. The successor to this game, Skyward Sword, feels much more tightly connected to the concept, motions made are nearly exact, and plenty more of the items on offer actually utilize the feature. The GameCube and Wii U releases of the game feel much more like the definitive versions to me. You still have directional sword swipes, but they're tied to the angle you hold the control stick, which feels much better since the lack of visual feedback isn't as harsh. In regards to the other items and abilities in your arsenal, there's some pretty fun ones available to you, with the coolest ones being new takes on classic gear. The Gale Boomerang is a really neat way to power up a long-standing staple, and the ability to make bomb arrows provides a cool way to use two items in tandem. My personal favorite remixed item is the Double Claw Shot. Rather than flatly extending the range of the hookshot, they instead let you dual wield. It opens up the ability to make some visually interesting and fun challenges, involving snappy movement from one wall divot to the next. Alongside those fun options, however, are some rather odd picks. As much as I love the ball and chain and the Beyblade, it really feels like they had one or two solid ideas for them and then pretty quickly fizzled out. There's hardly anywhere meaningful to actually use these items outside their own dungeons. 
The last thing I'll touch on in this section are the hidden skills, taught to us by a mysterious skeletal warrior whose presence can only be summoned in wolflink form. These abilities open up your options during combat by unlocking special attacks. I think this was an excellent addition, and much like the upgrades you get in wolf form by being able to teleport, the hidden skills enhance the aspect of learning what it means to be a hero through the fact that you're literally learning from a former hero. Originally, I was going to spend a bit of time complaining that the game doesn't utilize them well, but I think, in actuality, their inclusion in the combat loop is very nicely tuned. Even if they didn't have a major gameplay effect, they're all animated well, do nice damage, and are easy enough to pull off in the midst of combat that there's no reason not to use them once or twice once you've unlocked them. The back slice and mortal draw are my two personal favorites, though I'm sure I'm not alone in that regard. Twilight Princess is full to the brim with dungeons to crawl and caverns to explore. Zelda is notorious for its selection of places that the player finds themselves in time after time. Ancient temples, volcanic cave systems, and the ever-present water dungeon are all concepts revisited in plenty of games, Zelda especially, but I think the locations used in this game in particular are some serious heavy hitters. What sets these dungeons apart for me are the choice in aesthetic and atmosphere, as well as the miniature stories told throughout each one. Goron Mines, with its heat-stricken halls, exposed mineral veins, and deep, foreboding music. Lakebed Temple, with its surprisingly huge structure and plentiful floors that begin to feel like a labyrinth as you swim from one objective to the next. Arbiter Grounds and its ruined expanses. These places feel lived in, or rather, that they used to be. In most cases, these dungeons are overrun or abandoned, which helps sell the desolate atmosphere the game goes for. But in places like Snow Peak, with Yeto and his wife, or the Forest Temple and its monkeys. That isolation gets replaced in some small part by Fellowship. When you save those monkeys or meet up with the Elder Gorons in the mines, it doesn't just serve a gameplay purpose, it also helps to push forth that feeling of adventure and heroism that I mentioned in the opening moments. Hyrule Castle is a great example, and it might be the best iteration of the castle in any Zelda title, save for maybe Breath of the Wild. A bold claim? Maybe. What sells it is the slow build of the music, adding depth and menace to the instruments as you climb floors and inch closer to the final battle. It fully cements this as one of the coolest dungeons in a Zelda title, if not one of the coolest dungeons I've ever been in. To me, music is a very important component to a video game. Twilight Princess nails that aspect without question. Haunting melodies, desperate chases with pulse-pounding beats, somber piano, it's all here and it is all fantastic. The only way it could have been made better would have been a slightly better implementation of its instrumentation. It's clearly being played on MIDI or some other digital medium. If these tracks were orchestral in some way, it would have elevated the music to an inaccessibly powerful level. One place where the dungeons can fall a bit flat though, is that some of the puzzles can be a bit simple at times. Zelda's never been a paragon of brain teasers, but some of these challenges are painfully simple. That being said, it's not necessarily a bad thing. The intent doesn't seem to be to present mind-bending conundrums, but rather it's a dungeon. Locked doors with keys to find, obstacles that need the hidden item to handle, it's less a puzzle box than just a cool adventure to go on. Shoot the eye with the arrow, magnetize yourself to the ceiling with the iron boots, Spin the wheel. it provides satisfaction and fun in a way that's unique from the aha moment of a puzzle clicking in your mind. There's still problems to solve, but they're never things I got stuck on, at least not in the most recent playthrough of course. One last thing I wanted to touch on were the boss fights. I find that they're very theatrical in this game. Booming music, large arenas with larger enemies. They're fun and frantic, and they usually sport some crazy weak spot they gotta smack a bunch. For me, just about every single one is a knockout. The only two who don't really interest me are Fyrus due to his boring room layout, and Morpheal because water combat is pretty underdeveloped. But each of the other bosses sticks to their gimmick in a very satisfying way. When I say satisfying, I really mean it. Some of these fights are fantastic set pieces. The giant plant thing that sits in a lake of poison, you have to use the monkey mid-boss who freed himself from mind control, drops bombs into the arena for you to toss with the gale boomerang. Stow Lord in the sinking sand pit, spinning around the arena's edge as countless undead claw to surface the sand. Argorok in the open air arena, jumping from stone to stone in the whipping winds with your double claw shots. Xant and his devious magic teleporting you from arena to arena, forcing you to use every trick you've learned to fend off his manic ways. And the final boss. Man, the final boss. Zelda being puppeteered by Ganon, the massive pig beast transformation he takes on, working alongside Zelda on horseback as you ride across the fields to dismount Ganon, culminating in a one-on-one -on -one sword fight encircled by a ring of flames that enforce the two of you to duel for the fate of Hyrule. You know what? I changed my mind. This video is biased. This is the best game ever made.
Anyways, you'll probably notice that I kept a lot about this game pretty vague, and that's because I really think you need to enjoy this game yourself if you haven't. I know I spoiled a lot, but even so, there's plenty of stuff I intentionally left out. The kid's Vordon plotline, any mention of Zelda, and even the really neat repeating fights with King Bulbin. These are things integral to the experience for the first time, but if you feel I left some stuff out that you want to hear my thoughts on, I'd be more than happy to make a sequel video to this. Just leave a comment down below and let me know. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for your patience with me. I know the other analysis videos were ages ago by now, but hopefully with any luck, production time won't be nearly as long in the future. This is Red from Topic Change, signing off.